um, engagement with the spirit realm, uh, these principalities and powers that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote about. I mean, he made it very clear in Ephesians chapter 6, that's the letter that he wrote to the church at Ephesus, which is in Turkey, uh, where he said, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. His point is, we're not wrestling against or contending with human opponents, even though we may see people of a different political party or a different lifestyle choice or a different skin color as the enemy. That's really not true. The true enemy of mankind, of all mankind, whether we realize it or not, it's not, you know, us humans one against another. It's really these principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, cosmic rulers of this present darkness. Uh, Paul was talking about spiritual entities who have rebelled against the creator of the universe and who basically want to destroy humanity. And they're doing it by getting us to fight with each other. So Paul was trying to tell us, hey, look, spiritual warfare, guys, that's what this is about. It's against these principalities and powers. And it begins, for Christians, on our knees. It's hard because as humans, especially as men, we see a problem, we want to fix it. But we're operating in the natural realm, you know? <laughs> We've got our natural senses, we see a problem, we want to f and oftentimes that means fixing the person we disagree with. But that's not it. The enemy already wins if we already approach that other person with hatred. If we as Christians want to fulfill the one job Jesus gave us, which is to make disciples of all nations, we have to quit making ourselves a stumbling block between the people who don't know Jesus and him. All right. Um, well, you kind of answered the second question too, but maybe we can go a little bit deeper into it. What specifically are the principalities and powers that Paul speaks about? Are they, you said they're spirit beings now, mm -hmm. are they, uh uh, if you can just extend on that a little bit, maybe? The principalities and powers that Paul wrote about uh, fall into a couple of different categories. I, I guess the easiest way to describe them would be fallen angels and demons. The difference between fallen angels and demons is a simple one. Fallen angels, corporeally, we read in the Bible a number of times where angels interact with humans and do physical things. Uh, they eat a meal with Abraham. They eat a meal with Gideon. Uh, they uh, they fight with the citizens of Sodom and things like that. Angels can appear in physical form. They can actually do physical things, too, because we read in Genesis chapter 6 about the angels who saw that the uh, human women were fair and chose wives, or perhaps just took wives. Uh, demons, on the other hand, are totally spirit. They need to inhabit a physical body in order to uh, interact with us in the physical plane. Uh, or you know, they, they, can, they can oppress us, which you know, can be a feeling of uh, depression or, or dread, um, uh, anxiety, uh, stress. Um, in the worst form, most intense form, demonic possession is where they actually overwhelm and take over a human. Um, it's probably not as spectacular as what we see in the films, but it's, there are cases where it does, having talked to deliverance ministers or exorcists, uh, it sometimes gets that spectacular, that gruesome, that dangerous, that frightening. But um, those would be the powers, principalities, thrones, dominions. The way Paul writes about them, there, there's got to be some kind of a hierarchy there because those are terms that could also be applied to uh, human figures of authority. But in the context that he wrote, it's pretty clear he's talking about inhuman entities, Absolutely. spiritual forces, cosmic, uh, cosmic forces. Um, but uh, yeah, it, we, we normally don't perceive them as humans, and it's probably best that we don't. In fact, God made it pretty clear to Moses that he didn't want humans trying to contact the spirit realm. Do not consult mediums. Do not talk to necromancers. Because we as humans are not prepared for the interaction. We see a being that is indescribably beautiful, a being of light, and we assume he's one of the good guys. But as Paul warned his readers, even Satan appears as an angel of light. The demonic realm, the spirit realm, they really don't have anything to gain by scaring, literally scaring the hell out of us. They would rather lull us into a false sense of security. Amen, brother. Amazing. So are the 70 sons of God from the Deuteronomy 32 worldview the same gods worshipped worldwide from India to Peru? Yes. Uh, and the interesting thing about that number 70 is that it doesn't necessarily refer to a specific actual number. Uh, 
now the Bible makes it clear that we were talking about the same ones, the gods of the nations, because in Genesis chapter 10, where we read about the sons, the descendants of Noah, uh, the so-called table of nations, uh, there are 70 listed there. But in the ancient Near East, not just with the Hebrew culture, but all across the ancient Near East, the Akkadians, the Amorites, everybody in the ancient Near East understood that 70 represented the complete set. In other words, not one left out. So, in fact, we see that number elsewhere in the Old Testament, like the 70 sons of, of Gideon who were um, uh, slaughtered by, uh, was it uh, Abimelech? You know, even though Gideon, by the way, said, I don't want to be the king, I'll just make an ephod for myself and, uh, you know, stuff. But his son Abimelech, or, you know, uh, illegitimate son, uh, his name means my father's the king. So, yeah, interesting. And he's the one, but, he, but by, did, did Gideon really have 70 sons? It seems unlikely, but it means that all of them were killed except for the one survivor. So the number 70 means all of them. The Canaanites believed that their chief god, the creator god El, who um, his mount of assembly was Mount Hermon, which is the northern border of Israel, Lebanon, and Syria today, um, where the watchers descended and made their pact to take human wives. Uh, he held court there with his 70 sons, the 70 sons of El. You go back a little further in history into the uh, about the time of Abraham, and there was a city in northern Syria by the name of Ebla. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Emar, Emar, uh, not far from modern Aleppo, where uh, scholars have you know dug up you know the clay tablets and found the records and all that. And there was a, a an annual festival held in the spring uh, where the people of Emar would sacrifice 70 lambs. This was usually done around the, the first day of the first month, the first uh, of Nisan. Um, or, or, you know, about two weeks before the, the Hebrews would later celebrate Passover. They would sacrifice 70 lambs for Dagon, who was their chief god, who uh, it was just El by a different name. Dagon and the 70 gods of the city. Again, representing all the other gods of the divine council, all the other gods other than the chief god, the king of the pantheon, Dagon. So you got the Canaanites believing there, the ancient Amorites of Emar with their 70 gods. The interesting thing about the 70 is that when God gave the feasts to Moses, let me, let me back up, I'll save that for just a second. When, when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, um, but before he gave him the plans for the tabernacle, he did something interesting. He called Moses and said, okay, you and your brother Aaron, who was the high priest, Aaron's two sons, and the 70 elders of Israel come up Mount Sinai. And so no one else was allowed near the mountain. Okay, so you touch the mountain and, you know, God would smite you. But Aaron, Moses, the 70 elders of Israel climbed the mountain and they be, this is, this is in Exodus 24, they beheld the God of Israel and he did not touch them, he did not harm them. They beheld the God of Israel and ate and drank. They had a meal up there on Mount Sinai, the 70 elders of Israel. Now why did God do that? Because, now wait a minute, how is it possible that we're told that you, man cannot see the face of God and live? Well, this is where one of the examples in the Old Testament where we see the second power in heaven we begin to get a picture of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Yes, God the Father in all his glory, when he passed by Moses who was in the cleft of the rock, could not see his face because it's, it's overwhelming. But God in the flesh, we see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament in a number of places. That is God in a form that humans can perceive. And he called these men up his holy mountain and had a meal. It was a symbol of what was going to happen well, at, in, well, it's a symbol of what's going to happen when we are finally restored to the divine council, when God finally brings us back into the divine council, which we got kicked out of when Adam and Eve <laughs> disobeyed. But this was a message to the 70, 70, meaning all the gods of the nations. This is what is in store for humanity. You're toast and you're being replaced. It's like the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son we will someday be welcomed back, covered with pig dung and, and smelling awful and looking horrible, and God will welcome us with open arms, and, and that is be the restoration of humanity to the divine council. His message to the 70 gods, again, representing all the gods of the nations. Now, here's the thing. The Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, I wanted to talk about this in my time today, and I, without getting another hour, I couldn't get into it. The, the Spring Festival, this ancient city of uh, uh, Emar, pagan city, 
sacrificing 70 lambs in the spring, okay, around the time of the Passover, which is when Jesus was sacrificed, who John the Baptist called, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay? Jesus was the perfect lamb to sacrifice. The fall feast, which was the feast, as Rabbi Zef Parat talked about earlier today, the Feast of Tabernacles. When God gave that feast to Moses, he said, okay, here's the plan. It's a seven-day feast, a seven-day festival. On day one, you sacrifice 13 bulls. Day two, you sacrifice 12. Day three, 11, et cetera, seven days. Counting down by one each day, 70 bulls sacrificed. The bulls. In the ancient world, the bull imagery is connected to these pagan gods over and over again. El, chief god of the Canaanites, called Bull El. Kronos, chief god of the old gods of the, the Greeks, the Titans. His name comes from a Semitic word meaning horned one. And yet God, giving the feast to Moses, said, okay, here's what Passover, here's what the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles represents. Represents God delivering his people from all the other gods of the world, all the other gods of the nations. Seventy bulls, the complete set, not one left out. They are sacrificed. God has delivered his people from the pagan gods, the, all, all the gods that God allowed, allotted to the nations of the world. And it, as Zeb pointed out, when Jesus came the first time, he was sacrificed as the lamb at Passover in the spring. When he comes back, it's tabernacles time, where God delivers his people from the gods of the nations. It's beautiful. That's amazing. It's just mind-blowing. How everything's so perfect and just kind of fits together like that, it's just, ah. Uh, I know. Coach knows, all right. Um, so it's like almost like you read this when I wasn't looking, because you're just going through my questions. <laughs> Let me switch batteries before we die. Sure.